Action, things like that. You so, know? like, what are the, like, what's the top five calls you get in the middle of the night? Problems. I don't know what the top five are because the hospitals get first calls and we get like the critical. Say, I was on this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And my my calls. Maybe you can talk about these things. Are good. Agitation and sedation. Like okay. so, an agitated patient first being just a non-vented agitated. And okay. Then a person on the vent that's you may need to increase their sedation right. because they're not working with the vent. Right. So let's do vented patient only. Okay. I want to keep these very yeah, quick, 15, good. 20 minutes, yeah. so we don't get overwhelmed Sorry, with and maybe to, overwhelmed with like information. Maybe to like piggyback on kind of a similar thing is like I was on last week with a kite during the day. Mm-hmm. And she left for like 10 minutes to go to her <laughs> office. And this guy starts to like he's on a vent, starts agitating, fucking the vent. And I'm like I don't know what to do. So yeah. she has to come back, but you know it's. Is he plugged? Is he not sedated enough? Does he need to be paralyzed? Yeah, is he bronchospasm? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, how do you work yeah, through that yeah, situation? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot. So, I guess, like any situation, vent, let's go vent and agitation. <laughs> or desynchrony, right? Mm-hmm. So, when you say desynchrony, meaning they're bucking the vent? Yeah, bucking the vent, and maybe because of that, they're hypoxic or something like that. All right. Um, so the first thing you want to figure out is are they stable, meaning they're not dropping their sats or something like that, versus unstable, right? Hypoxic. So they're bucking the vent, they're agitated, but their sats are 95, 96%, less urgent, you know, you have time to move. They're unstable, they're getting more hypoxic with it. Let's start with um, just stable, okay? So when you first put a patient on the vent, it really depends what type of patient there is. So I mean, this could be honestly like a three hour lecture because there's so many uh, branches in this. So stable, but did they just get put on a vent? Are they on a vent already? Anyway, when you get put on a vent, you know, some patients can just get PRN medications. They're good with Ativan, one milligram Q2 hours, and fentanyl 50 50 mics Q2 hours, right? Some patients don't need anything, believe it or not. They're comfortable on a vent, and they're awake on a vent, all right? Like you drop the tube and they're on Zippo? They're, you get, give them some initial stuff, and they wake up two, three hours later, and they're okay. Not a lot of them. They probably need a little something because it's anxiety-provoking, but they don't need a lot. Um, but if, you're, if you want to do PRNs like Ativan, a milligram, like I said, one, to, one milligram, Q2 hours, fentanyl, 50 mics, Q2 hours. Or you could do dilated, you know, uh, um, milligram IBQ two hours as well PRN and the, and the dilated is and you can put that PRN agitation but you have to make the fentanyl something else then you know Ativan PRN agitation fentanyl uh, per CPOT score you can say that's a that's a pain score per what CPOT C P O T that's what the the pain scale if you're on a vent yeah right yeah okay now they get more they, they're needing more propofol usually is our sedative of choice you can go up to our scale say zero to 50 of propofol so you go they're agitated on the vent you know, you know what do you want us to do he's on 20 of propofol you could say give him a dose of ativan and fentanyl and raise the propofol up to 30 to 40 or go up on the propofol doctor we're up to 50 of propofol what do you want us to do right he's still agitated and you go, and what's the problem with propofol sometimes? Hypotension? Yeah, hypotension. So it, it's, it's a pretty hypotensive type medication. If you get up above 50 into the 60, 70, 80 range for days and days, they're at risk of something called Press Syndrome. Not Press Syndrome, Pris Syndrome, propofol-induced, I uh, forget what the thing is, but they get rhabdo, renal failure, metabolic acidosis. So that's why we always keep it at 50. But if you're in a bind, just it's not going to hurt for them to be on 80 of propofol for like 24 hours even. So just say, go up to 80 of propofol. Like you're doing a procedure or something and they're really, go up to 80 of propofol. Okay? Um, so 50 really is the max that we think of in a non-acute situation to get them sedated. 50 of propofol, fentanyl, Ativan, right? PRN. Tell the nurses, can you use the PRNs first before going up on the propofol? Okay? They're still somewhat agitated. Let's say they're a post-surgical patient, so some like their agitation is likely going to be pain. 
So you may start off with fentanyl instead, a fentanyl drip, right? Zero to 300 is the dosage of that. Max is 300. So which one you start may depend on the clinical scenario. Oftentimes patients can be on both. Fentanyl is uh, a, a per C-pot. Propofol is per RAS. You know what the RAS score is? The Richmond Agitation something or other SS, R-A-S-S. And you, you want these patients somewhat um, a little sleepy. But not like snowed. Not snowed. So RAS of negative two to zero. Okay. So like, when are you deciding to right. give them a fentanyl, you know, PRN versus putting it right on the drip? You try the, the bolus first, if it doesn't work, you use the drip? Or? Yeah. yeah. So try PRNs first. Try PRNs. So theoretically, you want to try PRNs first. I already told this today. Uh, so, PRNs, there. try that. If that's not working, nurses will give you pushback on just doing PRNs because they yeah. um, But that's not the right thing. It shows that patient outcomes are worse when they're too sedated. That's why on the Richmond scale, we want to keep them negative two to zero. It's a negative five to five scale. We want them ne zero to negative two, which means sleepy. But if you like talk loud or do that, like they're going to wake up. They're going to wake up. Yeah, arousable, right? So if somebody comes off the streets, you intubate them, and they end up in the unit. Like, do you order Ativan and Dilaudid and fentanyl PRNs right away? Or? Yeah, they should be on some PRNs, and oftentimes they are going to end up on a propofol drip or fentanyl drip off the bat. But going forward, like the next day or something, really try to come down on those sedatives. Okay. You know, it's, it's kind of those, you, it's at the time, like how agitated they are, how comfortable. Usually, they're pretty sick, they're coming to the unit, so we are going to sedate them a little bit more with drips and PRNs. But give them the, order the PRNs right away. So yeah, 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 order the PRNs yeah. right away so they have them, yeah, right? Okay, and they okay. should be, by good nursing, go to the PRNs first when the patient's agitated. If that doesn't work, then they'll go up on the propofol. And that should be all automated in the order set that okay. they are going up, right? So what happens, so they're on propofol, of 50 max dose they're on fentanyl at 300 that's max dose and they're still agitated um, first thing you want to see if, is there some source of pain that we're not like really identifying that we should have like they're ha actually having like a perf bowel and that's why they're you know tachycardic and agitated um, is the you know is the restraint too much that type of thing so make sure there isn't a secondary cause for them to be agitated um, you can add something called Presidex, which is a alpha agonist, which actually um, works like clonidine. Um, and it doesn't really sedate the patient, but it just kind of chills them out. So all these people, like all these COVIDs we have, seem like they're all in Presidex. Is that because we're out of propofol? No, it's not? because for some reason, I'm sure like this virus, when it affects people, it it, it affects their brain. I'm, I'm almost positive because all of them universally need like a ton of sedation. Yeah, but there was some chatter that we were low on propofol. We're gonna be low on everything. Okay. Everything. Uh, so is Presidex a substitute for propofol or is it used for something completely different? Presidex you could use by itself um, or it could be an add-on to anything. It's a different, it's different than a sedative, it's different than a analgesic. Yeah. Um, you can use this on a awake patient even. Okay. Because it doesn't really hit their that respiratory. That was my thing. The question was for somebody that he wasn't on a vent, and they were like, "Can we try a Presidex drip?" Right. And I was just like, "Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Presidex you can do. Okay. Okay. That's the one thing you can do. Okay. There's also something called ketamine. You can do a ketamine drip on a wake patient, but I would not recommend Presidex. it. Okay. Uh, Presidex you can. Um, there's something called ketamine. Presidex, so we'll talk about ketamine in a second. So propofol, hypotension, right? Mm -hmm. Fentanyl, what can it cause? Respiratory depression. Drive, yeah. Yep, so all of these can cause respiratory de drive, depression, except Presidex. Hypotension. Hypotension as well. Not as much as propofol, though. Presidex, what's it known for, mainly? I was going to say, I don't know much about it. Bradycardia, because okay. it acts like clonidine on the neural. You guys know what clonidine is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like a clonidine patch. Mm -hmm. So bradycardia and hypotension. Sometimes I'll keep going up on it. The nurse is like, oh, his heart rate's like 55. I'll say keep going up on it if his hypotension is, there's no hypotension, okay. right? 
So it'll cause bradycardia. That's the thing to watch out. So if you have these patients and they say the heart rate's like 35, 40, look at all their meds first. That's the first thing in bradycardia. Look at the meds because we're probably causing it. Presidex is one of those that can do it. So what's the number you're trying to know with Presidex? Uh, yeah, I think it can go up to like 1.5. Uh, as far as the heart no, rate? No, heart rate, please. What what would I tolerate? Yeah. Probably fifty. Fifty. It depends on the clinical severity. If they're hypotensive too, I probably would be sixty. So okay. at what point, if they're that greedy, do you say stop it and give atropine? Again, it goes down to clinical scenario. If they're hypotensive, I mean, I've had patients thirty-five heart rate, but their blood pressure is one hundred and sixty. I'm not going to do anything with that. I'll, I'll tell them to lower the Presidex, but I'm not mm -hmm. going to give them atropine. Yeah. Like if they're on like a beta blocker, will you stop that? Potentially, yeah. To, uh, Tolerate more of that? Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are your main drips. Ketamine is a great drip because it's the only drip that um, actually kind of increases your heart rate and, and hemodynamically increases your blood pressure. So ketamine, you will see this in your surgical world. They'll use this for conscious sedation for kids, yeah. for ortho yeah. stuff and adults. Um, but it's a good drip. We don't use it as much. We should use it more. We don't have much of it. Like, we don't have much of anything here. Uh, but we really should think more about ketamine. Um, so, like, is ketamine a better option for, like, a septic patient who has hypotension? Yeah, it is. It is. We should be using it more. I, 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 I try to put, when I'm rounding in the, in the unit, I, I try to push a little more ketamine than the other stuff. So, patients really agitated. These are the drips that you go to. You can increase the PRNs. You can go to two. The, you know, the patient's on outpatient Percocet, then fentanyl 50 is probably not going to do much. Go up to 100 of fentanyl. Just go to straight dilaudid, 1 to 2 milligrams Q2 hours, you know. Um, the other things you can do, they haven't really had much success in um, the studies, at least, is like Haldol. You know, not like a, a, a baby dose, like, uh, but like 5 of Haldol, Q6 hours. What do you have to watch with Haldol? You guys know what Haldol is? Mm. It's a psychology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like something it, on the EKG. Yeah. I don't know what it is. But it's uh, <laughs> QTC. QTC yeah, 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 yeah. So look at, so you can order QTC Q shift. And I usually, if it's over 475, I usually say you can't use it. So do they measure that off of the monitor strip? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. So Haldol, you can say, you can start, if it's a little old lady, start 2.5 Q6. If it's a little larger, do 5 Q6. Do you know what Epic has for the dosing of Haldol from the weekend? So it was 0.5, 1, and 2. Yeah. And I go to the nurse, I'm like, so how do you feel about 0.5? And yeah. she's just like, ah. <laughs> well, I think She laughed at you. That's, uh, that's the hardest thing. Is like, we don't know these people. Yeah, like, yeah. Dilaudid and fentanyl and Ativan. Like, I get the doses you guys get will kill somebody upstairs. Yeah, well, we're on the vent, right? <laughs> so yeah. so, we, so yeah. it, essentially, like, with the max I would give to somebody on the floor, you more or less double most of these, right? Can, yeah. Yeah. Haldol, you got to be careful just because of the QTC. If a patient's on a vent, you could give them 20 of dilaudid and, you know, it's, I mean, they'll get hypotensive, but the vent will pick them up, you know, for the respiratory rate. The other thing you could do is at nighttime, Seroquel 100 to 200 at night. We don't, uh, we don't use that as much, but we should. How much again? Uh, 100, 100 at night, you could say. Just use 100. Maybe you drop it down to two. Drop it down to two. That's like once you're saying kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. No, no, that's uh, nightly, QHS, oh, nightly. yeah. Just to keep them Yeah, calm. that keeps okay. them calmer. Should probably use that more. Um, and that's what you have. You go up on the drips. Um, these are the drips that we use. We use a lot of PRN. We may use antipsychotics. Right. Um, can, I, can I call you back? The, the other drips that I did not talk about because we don't like to use them, they've shown mortality, morbidity, are benzo drips. Yeah, we... Ativan drip, <clears throat> Versed drips, right? Yeah. So when do we use those? Well, we use those in alcohol withdrawal. All right, um, because added, that's the, the drip of choice, but we really want to push on the floors. Use the CWA protocol. If you use it liberally, the CWA protocol, they really shouldn't, most patients shouldn't have to go on an Ativan drip. So we use it in those patients, and then we do use it in our paralyzed patients. And why do we do that? Do you guys know? Because remember we told you, so they're not just paralyzed and can pretty much feel everything. Right. So <laughs> if they do feel something, they don't remember it, yes, because of the amnesia. 
that yeah, you get with that's with that Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's that's not a good thing to be paralyzed and uh, and uh, feel it. So if you're on uh, like a sedative like propofol, are you still covered from that regard? In terms of amnesia? Yeah. No, not really. No. It doesn't have that great of an anesthetic effect. So it has par- some, but not as good if as that. You're Ativan. paralyzed, you need to be on prop and Ativan, yeah. for example? Yeah. Usually we're very liberal with the prop and the fentanyl on these paralyzed patients to make sure they're out. So you can just you can get away with just prop and fentanyl. You don't need to have Ativan. You should. You, you should. should have some low so dose. If they're yeah. paralyzed, they should be on Ativan. Yeah. And all and Ativan does accumulate, so if they're on like you put them on a baseline of two to start with, like by day 48 hours just reduce it to one and like 0.5 to just go down on it because it does accumulate and it takes patients forever to get them off the drips after that because it sticks in their body you take them off all the drips and everybody's like day, day 48 hours 72 hours they're not waking up we need to get a cat scan they get a cat scan it's negative uh we should talk about end of life care and then they wake up on day five <laughs> you know that type of thing <laughs> wow <laughs> And so, (laughs) Jesus did speak. Um, Things to think about with when they're on a bunch of sedatives, they may be hypotensive. So the one thing that I'm trying to drill into people, we don't have to keep bolusing them with fluids. It's just start them on a low dose levofed and support their blood pressure because it's likely sedatives. Okay, because we want to keep all these patients, especially ARDS, ARDS patients, dry, their lungs dry. So then, so we can pass on to our team, like, because that's a common thing we normally call for whenever we just bolus this. Yeah. So somebody comes in, we'll say these COVID ARDS people, they come into the ER, do, are they getting, if they have hypotension, that 30? Probably, yes. So They're getting that up front. That, that, that's going to be for the most, most, most patients, because we're using ideal body weight for that, two to three liters. After that, we you shouldn't will, give anything. You shouldn't, What's, unless you think they're clinically dehydrated. You know, you get the history; they haven't eaten for five to six days. They were on the floor for three days. Then you could be more liberal, or they're in DKA on top of things. You know, we had one patient like that. So you get, you, they got that flu bolus in the ER, and now you're getting, you know, yeah, there's no history that they're lying on the floor. Yeah. But they call you and they say, ah, their urine output's starting to drop. Are you giving them fluids to get that to a goal or no? It's tough. Like urine output, everybody will definitely hang their hat on that. But sometimes I'm, I'm a little loose on that because like, i mean like we, their creatinine is normal and their you know urine output drops a little bit and all these drips are you know like 150 an hour yeah, yeah, right like yeah. when you add all these up i i usually am saying start them on a presser because i was telling goop though like yeah you know we always go to like urine output he's like you guys waterboard and surgery yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's right exactly so so uh i would lean on the side of starting a presser okay What's a low dose rate? Is it like two to four? For what? For levofed. Levofed, uh, really five, five, five to five to thirty. So most patients are on maybe between five and fifteen. If they're higher than that, we could talk about pressors next time, right? Okay. Uh, if they're tachycardic with all this, you can do neo instead, neosinephrine, what you guys are more used to probably in the OR. Uh, I have no idea because we don't do that. Okay. Yeah, that's what anesthesia uses. Yeah, uh, yeah. neosinephrine. Yeah. That's, that's, that's like zero to three hundred. That's like so. If patients start becoming hypotensive, you want us to use low dose levo, and if that's still not touching their blood pressure, should we be going to vasopressin next? Yeah, I mean, you add on vasopressin, okay. but then I mean, if they're on, you know, ten to fifteen of levo and vasopressin, like we should know about it. Okay. You know, that's serious hypotension. Okay. We may decide oh, maybe he is dry let's give him some hypo let's give him some fluids or maybe there's something else involved like uh, cardiomyopathy let's get an echo you know um, but higher dose pressors we should know about okay uh, it's, it's a it's a protocol right they have a little hypotension you tell them to start being a fed and the nurses titrate it up right they do yeah they should know too if they're rapidly going up on it Unstable patient, it's kind of the same thing, but you may want to be a little more aggressive with, you know, give them two, you know, I gave last week, I was on call, like I gave them uh, two a dilated, two a Vativan, you know, to get them down um, because they were hypoxic. A lot of these ARDS patients, the COVID patients are going to be pretty hypoxic. Give them a dose of Nimba. If you're ever in trouble with desatting and you're sure the tube is in place, that's the first thing. You got to make sure the tube is in the trachea and in a good place. You can give them 10 of Nimbex. Okay, give them the Ativan, give them the Dilaudid, and 10 of Nimbex. That'll give you some time to think. So 
that was where you kind of came up last week. So, exactly. you know, you give them 10 of Nimbex, chills them out, the Nimbex eventually, and that solves your problem. Then the Nimbex wears away. So during that time, them. when they're chill, you know they're going to come out of the paralysis. So you want to use that time to maximize your sedative okay. sedative problems, right? It just buys you time. And, and then you may have to put them on a Nimbex strip for a small amount of time. So, okay. yeah, I'll be up in a little so bit. So when are you, a, um, you know, because we're trying to figure out, are they a bronchospasm, are they okay. having a plug? Like, right. I guess, what? how do you figure out, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not just giving people more sedation when they're, and then covering up the real problem they're right. having. Right, right. So, I mean, that that would be ventilator yeah. stuff, like yeah, peak pressures, plateau pressures. Yeah, it it goes into another lecture about, maybe we'll talk about that next, okay. in terms of not just general ventilator settings, but troubleshooting ventilator and seeing what's going on. Right, or even is the, someone's buck in the vent, you're trying to figure out, is it the vent versus sedation is the respiratory therapist a pretty yeah you guys should be working a hand in hand so suction listen to breath sounds make sure they have equal breath sounds and the patient's not having a pneumothorax or something like that get an x-ray possibly so the respiratory therapist is a reliable person to yeah tell you if it's a vent problem or not kind of okay. eh, sometimes <laughs> more reliable than me right? <laughs> yeah right because they're like i can't tell if it's a vent problem the patient's bucking the vent so then you'd know if you really sedate them or give them a dose of Nimbex, then all their, the, the outside garbage is controlled and they can see the waveforms and things and say, you know, the peak pressures are through the so roof. So it's still a vent problem. Even when you give them more sedation, it'll still be a vent problem. Yeah. Okay. I know that um, if the peak pressures are up, it's because there's no obstruction, right? It can be for multiple reasons. Mm. It could be a suction of the tube. It could be a pneumothorax. It could be collapse of the lung. You know, atelectasis, so it's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot to think about in critical care because everything is connected, you know. And so we're kind of laissez faire because we've done it for so long and kind of like, this is, this is, this is, this is what it is. But like, you have to break down every piece sometimes. And this agitation piece is very hard because you, you sedate a patient more, their, their morbidity goes up, their length of ventilation goes up. So these COVID patients are definitely yeah, challenging. Bears. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. All right. I was going to say, can I just give you, so here was literally my scenario. Yes. Just yeah, let's do your scenario. Okay, so this was a guy on the vent. He was here with respiratory failure. Basically, his breathing rate went up. He was set on the vent for 24, and he was breathing at 35. Res, or respiratory he's a COVID or what? He's not a COVID. He okay. was just in a Is he here still or no? He's still here. Where is he? He's 319 oh, Okay, upstairs. all right. Um he basically started his respiratory rate going up. The vent was set at 24. He was um, breathing at 35. Respiratory came by, looked at him, said it's not a vent problem, it's a station problem. Um, they told was he awake? So, good question. Didn't ask that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's a good starting point. <laughs> um, no, but they did say he was agitated, so okay. I think he's awake. But, um, what was his scenario? What's this guy so in for? So his, his, um, his story is, I think he's the, he's the guy we think has meningitis, but oh, he came fuck. in, seizure-like activity, mm. septic shock. We think it's meningitis. He was so ruled out COVID? Any, he's a ruled out COVID. Oh, okay. um, and basically, they think it's meningitis. Spiking temps still don't know because the LP couldn't be done. Basically, it was failed. Um, they weren't able to do it. Um, they tried an IR or what? They tried here, but now his platelets are eight, so he can't go to IR. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a mess. What's his creatinine? His creatinine today is one point seven. Okay. Platelets of eight. We gave him a two pack today, so he's a sick guy. He has cancer everywhere. He's stage uh, four chemo on chemo. Oh, is he in DIC or no? Or T C C? Seems like he might be. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, I, so, little, little I got yeah. I got sucked project. into that. All right. <laughs> sorry. Let me dig back out. So, Let's go back to the so agitation. Brief, agitation, <laughs> breathing increasing. They tried two of Versed PRN, which we didn't talk about that as an option. So Versed is a benzo. It's much shorter acting than Ativan. Okay. It's a fair choice, but you'd have to go higher on Versed. So Ativan, okay. like want, like I would give him ten of Versed. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So this little two maybe could have been the problem? The could have been, yeah. PRN? It could have been very small. Okay, so he was getting two PRN, and then, he, oh, but he has a Versa Drip in Funny. addition. So Versa Drip got two PRN, then... How bit, how do you know what his Versa Drip was yep, at? Yep, so they had titrated up from one to five. Mm -hmm. And then, five. They, Not and a then they went dose. from their Presidex 0.8 to one. Okay. Tried that, and I guess... Still looked like he's in distress. Still no change in his respiratory rate. Still uncomfortable. So we just did first at two milligrams. Yep. PRN. Yep. Still on the drip. And all he's on now is a verset drip. Yep. All right. And Presidex. So and Presidex. Have, so yep. would you have done Nimbix on that guy? It was he desatting? Not desatting. No, I would not have. No. I would have gone up on the verset drip. I would have given him bol. I would have given him a big. He bol got five verset boluses. Of how much? So that was, I guess, the two. I would probably give him an Ativan at that point. At the next? Yeah, I would have given okay. him two of Ativan, a milligram of Dilaudid. So start with those first. Yeah, like give him the PRN, the push. Yep. Because you raise the drips, that's not going to do much. I was going to say, they asked for a fentanyl drip. Yeah. So I called the hospital. And that's fine. And they said, sure. Yes. So you can do a fentanyl drip, but you want to give him a bolus of something. Because so those give, drips, yeah. those drips, you know, you increase them. It's it's over an hour. Two milligrams over an hour. So it's not like they're getting a yeah. bolus, right? Yeah. So always hit them with some PRNs okay. first and then go up on the drip. Okay. So I would have said, mm -hmm. give them two of Ativan, a milligram of Dilaudid, go up on the Versed drip to six. Okay. Um, and the Presidex drip, is it max? Uh, no. Then go up on the Presidex drip. Okay. Find out what the heart rate is beforehand yeah. before you go up on a press extra, yep. right? Yep. Yep. That was Does that make sense? Yeah, that was really helpful. So hit him with the PRNs first, Sharon Burke. Like I think this is the 